Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this installment of the Cape Perpetua Speaker Series. Today, we'll be hearing from Lisa Hildebrand on Kelp to Whales, Evidence for a Bottom-Up Trophic ca Cascade. Uh, and next weekend, we'll be hearing from Kristen Don on a deeper understanding of Oregon's marine reserves. I'd like to acknowledge that the Cape Perpetua area landscape stretches from Yahats to Florence and is the traditional territory of the Selects tribe and Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayuslaw tribe, and acknowledge the tribal governments and their roles historically and today in taking care of these lands. A little bit about the Cape Perpetua Collaborative. Uh, we uh, joined together in 2017 and the collaborative's vision is to foster conservation and collaboration within local communities for scientific exchange, management, awareness, and stewardship from the land to the sea in and around Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. Um, and our three guiding principles are community engagement, leveraging resources, and engaging in partnerships. And you can see at the bottom here, we have a variety of locals. These are our founding partners, but I also like to acknowledge that we have a variety of other partners, local businesses, um, uh, local governments, as well as other nonprofits um, and organizations local to the area. We couldn't do our work without any of our partners. Um, real quick, a brief bit about the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. It's Oregon's largest of five marine reserves. Um, and in addition to the north and the south marine protected areas, there's some form of protected waters that stretch between Yahats and Florence. I mean, you can see the photos on the right here. Um, these are a variety of photos that have been taken by ODFW, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, from their research as they take a dive under the water. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about that, do tune in to our uh, session next weekend. Uh, we do host a variety of community science in the Cape Perpetua area, as you can see here, a variety of projects. Um, many of them are seasonal, but we also host monthly beach cleanups um, and our Cape Perpetual Bio Blitz series. You can connect up to that project through the iNaturalist app, and that will help us document biodiversity within the area. So if you take any observations of anything from land to sea in the area, that will upload to our project and help us um, document that. In addition to this uh, speaker series, we also host a young webinar uh, series, a young scientist webinar series on the second Tuesday of the month, October through April. Um, our next one's coming up this next Tuesday. Um, if you're interested in that, I believe the date is the 8th at 530. And if you like this presentation, um, you'll probably like that one as well. That one is about whales, uh, gray whales as well. And um, you'll get to see some cool drone footage. But you can find out more about all of our presentations and events and community science projects on our website at kperpetualcollaborative.org. Um, and I always like to encourage folks to connect with us on our Facebook and our YouTube page. And if you like the work we're doing, um, we do have a donate uh, button on our website. If you just click that, it'll take you through the steps. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Lisa Hildebrand. She is a fourth year graduate student at Oregon State University in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation Sciences under the supervision of Dr. Lee Torres in her Geospatial Ecology of Marine Megafauna Lab. She is an international student from Germany who very quickly after moving here in the fall of 2018, fell in love with Oregon and all it has to offer. Lisa has undertaken research on a handful of marine mammal species, including bottlenose dolphins, harbor seals, humpback, blue, and now gray whales who have become the focus of her graduate research. And with that, Lisa, I will let you take it over. Awesome, thank you so much, Tara. Okay, let's see. And while Lisa's pulling up her presentation, I just wanna let the audience know that um, uh, if you have questions throughout her presentation, please do feel free to add those to the Q&A box or the uh, chat box, and we will uh, address those at the end. Um, and then I see one quick question here. Is it being recorded? Yes, this presentation is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel on Monday. All right, Lisa, it's all yours. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tara. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today, uh, Saturday morning. I really appreciate it. 
Um, yeah, so as Tara mentioned, I'm Lisa Hildebrand. I'm a PhD student in the uh, GEM lab at the Marine Mammal Institute at Oregon State University, where I work with Dr. Lee Torres. Um, I've had a slight, a slight tweak in the title of my talk, but it's still, it's still about the same thing. So kelp to whales, indirect effects of a trophic cascade. Um, before I start, I really want to give a huge shout out to my um, three collaborators on this project, Enos Hildebrand, Solenderville, and my advisor, Lee. It's been a really awesome team um, that has really helped push, push this work along. And also a, a big thanks to um, Oregon Sea Grant, who partially um, funded this work. Okay, so the GEM Lab has been running a project for the last six years on fine scale gray whale foraging ecology in Port Orford along the southern Oregon coast. Um, and I gave a talk about that work um, about a year ago, um, and I ran that project for four years during my master's. And in Port Orford, gray whales typically forage close to shore in these rocky reef kelp habitats where they feed on zooplankton, predominantly mycid shrimp. And that kind of behavior is pretty similar um, to many other parts along our Oregon coast, including in the Cape Perpetua area. And part of that project is to look at what makes good quality habitat for gray whales, particularly for, um, for their feeding. But before I dive into the details, I want to give kind of a quick lesson or a quick recap on what trophic cascades are, since that is kind of central to, to this project. Let's see. Sorry. Okay. So let's look at a stereotypical Pacific Northwest kelp forest, a healthy system where everything is working perfectly and everything is balanced. So what we have at the bottom are kelps and other algae. They really form the base of this food web. And we also have microscopic planktonic algae um, that are also kind of serving the same purpose um, at the bottom of the food web. Then when we add in kind of our next level, we have small herbivorous fishes, some invertebrates. There's drift algae that breaks off of the kelp and dead animals. Um, that also provide kind of nutrients to the rest of the system. And here on the right side, we, we see some planktonic invertebrates and some sessile invertebrates. And we also see some like higher trophic levels like large crabs that also interact with these um, kelp, uh, with the kelp base. Then we get to our third level where there's a whole bunch more arrows, a whole lot more interactions, and we're starting to see some kind of meso predators like sea urchins and abalone and small predatory fish. Um, we're starting to see some sea stars pop into the system as they feed on these lower trophic levels, but they also act as predators. So once we get to the very top, we have a variety of predators that feed on a number of these different trophic levels. So we have sea otters, sea stars, large crabs, and large fish and octopus. And what I want you to take away, like three main takeaways from this healthy kelp forest system is that in a healthy system, sea urchins passively feed on pieces of drift algae. And this occurs for two main reasons. One is that kelp is healthy and abundant. So there's plenty of drift algae that's breaking off of kelp fronds due to a number of reasons, wave action or wind. And so those little pieces that break off are enough to sustain sea urchin populations. And two, sea urchin populations are being kept in check by their predators, sea otters and sea stars. And not only are these predators keeping urchin populations down in terms of their numbers, but the presence of these predators also influences how sea urchins behave in this environment. Because they feel this threat of predation from sea otters or sea stars, when urchins exist in this healthy, balanced ecosystem, they tend to be a little more cryptic. So they often, they're hiding in crevices, or they're tucked underneath rocks um, so that they're harder to find by their predators. But this doesn't prevent the drift algae kind of from floating into those cracks to sustain those populations. However, things don't necessarily always stay this balanced, unfortunately. A very well-documented trophic cascade across the Pacific Northwest occurs when sea otters are removed from the system, which causes a cascade of effects, whereby the loss of sea otters releases sea urchins from one of their main predators, and this allows sea urchin populations to expand. Then when the drift algae that the urchins have typically been feeding on passively can no longer support this expanding sea urchin population, 
urchins will switch to actively feeding on kelp stalks and fronds, which can ultimately lead to an urchin barren state because the loss of the kelp habitat, because it's not able to, to kind of keep up with the active predation by the sea urchins, then has rippling effects up the entire um, food chain. And, and it ends up affecting, you know, kind of all of the large predators, including crabs and fish and octopus. And so this is a very well documented classic cascade uh, throughout the Pacific Northwest, but nobody has ever really assessed the impacts of this on whales, and specifically gray whales, which when you see a photo like this, it's kind of bewildering because we, we, we see this a lot, gray whales kind of rolling around in kelp, draped in kelp, so <laughs> clearly there's, there's some relationship there. But what we wanted to look at um, was, was kind of these relationships in Port Orford by using the data that the GEM Lab has already been collecting as part of that long-term gray whale project that I mentioned at the start of my talk, because as you can see from this photo, there really is a lot of kelp in Port Orford, or at least there has been, but we'll get to all of that. Uh, first, let's, uh, I'm gonna give a brief overview of the field methods that we use in Port Orford. So what you're seeing here is just a little schematic of where we conduct this research. The gray um, outline is, is the shore or the land. And up here, the black, uh, sorry, the brown circle represents a location on shore where we track whale movements and whale behaviors using a theodolite, which is a surveyor's tool. And at the same time, we're undertaking prey assessments from a research kayak at each of these blue locations. And we, we do a number of things on the kayak, but one of them is that we drop a GoPro to assess prey quantity or abundance. So how much prey is at each one of those stations. And we're doing these two things simultaneously, which has allowed us to make inferences about gray whale foraging choices and prey dynamics. And I'll very quickly just shout out here that this project is going ahead again this summer in Port Orford for six weeks and that there is still an open spot for an OSU undergraduate student. So if you know someone who might be interested or if you yourself are, uh, are an OSU undergrad and interested, um, there's, there's a link here or you can shoot me a message or an email um, at the end of the talk. Um, for more information about how to apply and what it involves, but applications are due at the end of this month. Um, it's a really great project. Um, I would highly encourage um, anyone who's interested to apply. So this is just a short clip of what it looks like when we drop the GoPro stick into the water, which we raise at a constant speed in order to extract these images to assess um, uh, zooplankton prey abundance. And while the intent of these GoPro videos was always to assess prey abundance, in 2018, one of our project interns saw these very disturbing images at one of our sampling stations. And so what you're seeing here is a whole lot of urchins and a whole lot of dead looking kelp. In some of these, um, uh, on some of these stalks, you can even see like a lighter color, which we are, which we think is where urchins actively rasped down the kelp stalk. And so these images were pretty shocking to us, given the fact that we had videos from the exact same station just two years prior in 2016, where the station was completely inundated with kelp. It was almost, it was, it was pretty difficult for me to actually get a clear shot of this because there was so much kelp at that station in 2016. And unfortunately, last year in 2021, the station doesn't look a whole lot better. Um, and also, sadly, this isn't the only sampling sta uh, station where we've seen these changes, which was obviously quite concerning to us, this kind of loss of kelp and this um, huge introduction of sea urchins into the system. And from our project in Port Orford, we have evidence that shows that zooplankton, specifically the mycid shrimp, are found more commonly associated with reefs that contain kelp. And while we don't quite yet understand all of the drivers of mycid shrimp distribution and abundance, what we have seen in Port or Orford over the last six years is that reef habitats that contain kelp attract higher levels of zooplankton, which attract higher levels of gray whale foraging activity. 
And so this got us thinking about what these potential concurrent sea urchin and kelp changes could mean to the higher trophic levels of zooplankton prey and subsequently gray whales. Our hypothesis was that if we see this increase in sea urchin, it would lead to a decline in kelp health, which would lead to a decline in zooplankton abundance and therefore a decline in gray whale foraging. And so that's what we set out to test with this data set. So we undertook um, this analysis to look into these relationships using our standardized GoPro videos to assess sea urchins, kelp, and zooplankton, and then we used our theodolite tracking data to assess uh, gray whale foraging numbers. So because these GoPro videos were collected with a different project in mind, you know, not thinking that we would look at these trophic relationships um, through time. We had to be a little creative in how we quantified our different species occurrence data. But so we used the GoPro to assess sea urchins. And how we did this is we extracted screenshots from our videos at each of our sampling stations. And we undertook a detailed analysis of these images where we counted the number of urchins that we could see in the image. And we then also assessed the available urchin space. So to kind of get a sense of how many urchins could have occupied that habitat. And by dividing those two numbers, we got um, a, an estimate of sea urchin density. For kelp, we assigned one of four qualitative categories, which we converted into a numerical kelp health score. And as I've already mentioned, we developed a method to assess relative uh, zooplankton abundance through um, extracting screenshots from our videos. And then finally, we used our theodolite data to count the number of foraging whale points within a 30 meter radius of each of those sampling stations. So what we had by the end of this was that for every station that we sampled, we had um, accounts for sea urchin density, kelp health, zooplankton abundance, and number of gray whale foraging points. And so what we wanted to first do then was to see whether this hypothesis that we had about increasing urchins and declining kelp, zooplankton, and whales was kind of evident in our raw data. So we, we just wanted to kind of plot out that raw data to see if there's any spatial or temporal trends. So I'm gonna show you a number of these little um, panels, but what you're seeing again in dark gray, we have the shoreline and then the, the white area is the ocean. And each of these circles that you're seeing is one of our sampling stations. And these um, sampling stations are gonna be color coded according to species. So right now, all you're seeing is, is sea urchins, which is gonna be purple. And the darker the color of the circle, the more of that species there is. So a darker purple would ind indicate a higher number of sea urchins and a light or white color would indicate low or no um, sea urchins. So on this first panel for 2016, we're seeing the number of urchins. And as you can see, there's a lot of white or light colors, meaning that there was low numbers of urchins in 2016. When we add in the three other species, so in green, we have kelp, in orange, we have zooplankton, and in gray, we have the gray whales. Um, we see that for kelp, there's quite a lot of dark green, indicating quite a lot of kelp in 2016. We're also seeing quite a lot of orange, once again, meaning a lot of zooplankton in 2016. And the same can kind of be said for the gray whales, quite a few dark gray circles. Then when we add in all of the time series for the sea urchins, you can see that through time, we're seeing more and more dark purple circles and less and less of those light white colors. Because by 2021, essentially all of our stations had dark purple circles, which means that there was a lot of urchins basically everywhere. When we add in the kelp at the same time, we can see kind of the reverse effect through time, we're seeing less and less dark green and a little more of these white circles, although the trend maybe isn't quite so stark as with the sea urchins. For the zooplankton, however, it is quite a strong trend of for the first three years really having high amounts of zooplankton abundance. And then pretty rapidly, we're seeing this decline to 2021 where we had almost no zooplankton at any of our sampling stations and really a lot of white circles here. And the trend for gray whales maybe isn't so apparent um, in these plots. Um, obviously it's tricky to, you know, kind of just limit a huge animal like a gray whale to just a 30 meter radius. But we do kind of see this declining trend as well with more dark purples in the uh, dark grays in the first four years and then really light white colors by the very end. 
And so just by looking at our raw data in this kind of spatial temporal way, we saw that there was some evidence um, to support our hypothesis that this trophic cascade was maybe happening in Port Orford. So we obviously wanted to like verify this statistically and carry out some more tests. And so we really had two main questions that we wanted to answer. We wanted to know how does species occurrence relate to one another? And then we wanted to see how time and space affects those relationships. And so to do so, we carried out three different analyses. For the first question, we undertook a Pearson's correlation. So just looking at how numbers of species relate to one another. And then we use joint species distribution models to incorporate both the spatial component and then the spatial and temporal component. So I'm going to um, kind of one after the other show you the results um, of these three um, of these three analyses. And I'm going to do that using this schematic. So let's imagine that this is a kelp forest habitat somewhere in the Cape Perpetua area where we have all four of our species. So we have sea urchins, we have kelp, we have mycetrimp or zooplankton, and we have our gray whales. And all of these species are connected with arrows that have these different patterns. Um, and they all represent slightly different things. So these bold black dark arrows represent a direct effect of predation, which the zooplankton and the whales are connected with that arrow because the gray whales predate on the zooplankton. And the same for the sea urchins and the kelp. We then have this thick dashed line between the kelp and the zooplankton, which indicates a direct effect of habitat because the zooplankton use the kelp as their, as their primary habitat. And then finally, this very light dashed line indicates indirect effects between species that are happening because of these other direct effects. So let's jump into the first result of the Pearson's correlation. So what we're doing here is we're grouping all stations and all years together, and we're not accounting for space and time. And when we look at this, the results of this analysis, we see kind of what we would expect. Gray whales, zooplankton, and kelp are all positively correlated with one another. However, all of the species are negatively correlated with sea urchins, which makes sense. It's what we would expect. Sea urchins and kelp won't have a positive relationship. Um, therefore, sea urchins and zooplankton won't have a positive relationship. And therefore, sea urchins and gray whales won't have a positive relationship. However, once we start to account for space through our first uh, through our first joint species distribution model. Um, and we have to do this because we're resampling the same stations over time and within a season. Um, we see that we're starting to see some differences in our results. So our relationships between urchins and whales and urchins and kelp and kelp and whales all stay the same, but we're starting to see an interesting shift in the relationship between kelp and zooplankton and zooplankton and whales. That relationship has become negative, which doesn't really make that much sense, um, which doesn't really make that much sense. And finally, when we integrate time into the model as well, since you know this is a trend that's occurring over a long period of time and we need to account for that too, we can see that the relationships between whales, urchins, and kelp have remained the same across these three analyses, but they've just gotten stronger with the progression of these models. However, interestingly, and almost weirdly, I would say, we, we've had this complete reversal in relationships for zooplankton with the other species, um, where by the end of it, we have a positive relationship between urchins and zooplankton and a negative relationship between zooplankton and whales and zooplankton and kelp. And this is really interesting because when we look at the th trends over time, um, which are output by the exact same model, um, we see that we have seen a strong decline in zooplankton abundance. So what you're seeing here um, on the x-axis is year for each of the species color-coded. Um, and on the y-axis, it's just the amount of that species from low to high. And so through time, we can see urchins really increased throughout the study period. And at the same time, we've had this decline in kelp, a strong decline in zooplankton, and a decline in gray whales too. So these results are, are kind of confusing or confounding because 
it's, it's, it's kind of in contrast to what we're finding with this increasingly statistical positive relationship between zooplankton and urchins. It doesn't really make that much sense. Our current hypothesis is that while zooplankton have become less abundant over time, they may have become more spatially clustered and that, they, and that those clusters may have popped up in areas where there also happen to be a lot of urchins. There's definitely still a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of nuance between these relationships here. But right now we do know that um, across time, the abundance and the health of kelp, zooplankton, and gray whales has declined as sea urchins have increased, but that there do seem to be some kind of odd correlations um, when you integrate space and time. So let's bring it back to the classic Pacific Northwest kelp forest example that I showed at the start of my talk. And in fact, I have to say that this classic kelp forest ecosystem isn't actually representative to Oregon waters. And that's because sea otters haven't exi don't exist along the Oregon coast. But that's not a recent development. Sea otters, as many of you maybe already know, haven't existed on the Oregon coast for at least a century. So in Oregon, sea stars really have been the only main predator that has been keeping urchin populations in check. However, unfortunately, the onset of something called sea star wasting disease in 2013, followed closely by the 2014 to 2016 warm blob, which was an extreme marine heat wave that basically altered the whole oceanography and dynamics of the Pacific Ocean, led to the almost complete collapse of sea, or, uh, sea star populations throughout the Pacific Northwest, including Oregon. And in some areas, these declines of sea star populations were up to 90%. And so with the urchins released from their only predator on the Oregon coast, essentially, we saw, at least in Port Orford, we've seen this expansion of sea urchin populations um, that have actively begun feeding on kelp, which has led to this decline in kelp health, and which has then presumably had these cascading effects all the way up the food chain. And so what's kind of unique about our study is that we're the first to document this additional strand of this very complex food uh, ecosystem web by integrating the top predators, gray whales, that even though they don't directly feed on kelp or they don't have a direct interaction with sea urchins, have in fact been impacted by these changes since we've documented these indirect effects of this very established and classic trophic cascade all the way up to whales. And so I am a little sorry to say that the results of my work aren't maybe necessarily positive or uplifting, but what I want to spend kind of the, the, the next few minutes of my talk highlighting is other work that is already ongoing to try and better understand these relationships and these processes, um, as well as things that are being done to, to, to kind of combat this problem of increasing sea urchin populations and to ensure um, healthy kelp forest ecosystems on our coast. So as I mentioned at the start of my talk, this work was partially funded by Oregon Sea Grant, and it's part of a larger collaborative project between my advisor, Lee Torres, and Dr. Aaron Galloway at the Oregon Institute for Marine Biology in Charleston. And that project we like to call Kelp to Whales. And the project has three main goals. One is to characterize the nearshore communities of Oregon's subtitle kelp forests. A lot of work has, um, or, yeah, a lot of work has been done on kind of bull kelp forests um, in Oregon, but very little is known about the subtital kelp. So subtital kelp is kelp that doesn't tend to grow all the way to the surface. And so one of the main goals of this project is to really better understand the, um, the kind of dynamics of, of these subtital kelp forests and, and what they may provide to this whole ecosystem, um, reef ecosystem on the Oregon coast. A second goal is to study the underappreciated role of kelp forests as critical habitat for gray whales. And that's where my work or this, this project that I just talked about kind of slots into um, under that second goal. And finally, a third uh, goal of the project is to connect coastal communities to their kelp forests. And so I just wanna briefly mention some pilot work that has already been done to address goals one and three. So Aaron Galloway and his team conduct dive surveys to characterize near shore subtitle kelp forests. And they have already completed a pilot season of this work last year to see if their study design is effective and works essentially. 
And so what you're seeing here in the top left photo is an image of a custom fabricated video camera, which is mounted to two underwater lasers and a lighting rig, which Aaron and another diver take down to, to, to essentially photograph and take videos of these underwater um, habitats. On the top right, what you're seeing is a top or a bird's eye view of those dive surveys um, and the layout that those dive surveys have. So the divers essentially start in the central hub and then they do these kind of spokes um, and they do three spokes per dive survey where they survey out and then all the way back in. And what you're seeing on the bottom is um, essentially a side view of what that looks like. So you have diver one at the front that's holding the camera rig and on the way out on the spoke, they're they're filming the pelagic so that they that we can, you know, assess zooplankton or big bull kelp. And then on the on the return, they're filming the benthic habitat so that they can assess things like sessile invertebrates or mobile invertebrates, urchins and things like that to really get a holistic understanding of the pelagic and the benthic um, environment in these kelp ecosystems. And then the second diver who follows the first diver is the one laying out and reeling in the tape, as well as um, collecting additional count data using a slate. And so these pilot dive surveys have already led to some pretty interesting preliminary results. Um, what you're seeing here on the left are six dive sites, three in Cape Arago and three in Port Orford, and the density of three different species. So on the left, we have purple sea urchin density, in the middle, subsurface kelp density, and on the right, we have bull kelp density. And there's a lot of interesting things to take from this plot, but um, the one thing that I will mention is that it's interesting to note that um, there seems to be much higher purple urchin densities in Cape Arago, um, but at the same time, we have a higher density of subsurface kelp density at Cape Arago than in Port Orford. So clearly, these relationships between urchins and kelp aren't necessarily linear or very straightforward. And there may be other things that, that really, you know, impact how if you have an increase in one, why does why does the other decrease or maybe not decrease? Um, and so we really hope that, that this work will allow us to better understand those, those seemingly complicated relationships. The third goal of the project, as I mentioned, is to connect coastal communities to their kelp forests. And while there are several ways in which um, Lee and Aaron hope to achieve this, one of the ways is to bring people closer to Oregon's gray whales. And so I'm very excited to share with you a website that we have produced called um, Individual Whale. And I just wanna take a few um, minutes of this talk here to actually walk you through that website because um, it's really been a long time coming for this website to kind of come together um, and it's, li it's been live now for about two months. And so I just wanna give you a little taster, but I definitely encourage all of you to go to the website um, and to check it out yourselves. So what we have um, at the very beginning of the website is, um, uh, is um, a number of our very well-documented whales that we've seen year after year. Um, and especially those that have kind of experienced um, kind of life altering or, or kind of difficult events. Um, and so you can click on any one of these whales um, that we have um, documented over several years and kind of read about their stories and um, and see, you know, see how they're helping us learn more about them um, and, and what that means for their conservation. So essentially, if we click on equal, for example, um, equal is a male whale who we first saw in 2015, which means that he's about seven years old, but he may be older. And equal is a whale that we unfortunately um, witnessed. Um, uh, well, we, we, we saw him after he'd been hit by um, a boat propeller, most likely, because we saw these kind of propeller um, boat scars on his back. And while this is a really sad story, although I will say we have seen equal many times since then and the wounds have healed, um, we were also able to collect a fecal sample from equal the day after this happened. Um, and what we, what we did with those fecal samples is we extract hormones to understand um, kind of their stress levels. Um, we can also look at their sex hormones to see if they're male or female and if they're in reproductive age. And what was really interesting is that Equal had really, really high stress levels compared to 
you know, lots of other fecal samples that we've been collecting. So by witnessing this event, we were almost, we were basically able to validate all our other stress hormone levels because we knew that this individual had to be stressed out because he'd just been hit by a boat. And so we have lots of different whales um, that um, with stories similar to this, some are a little happier than others. We also have tabs on how we study our whales. So you may be wondering, how do I know that this whale is equal? We kind of walk you through how we are able to uniquely identify each individual gray whale because they have unique pigmentation. And so you can learn all about how to do that yourself. And then if you think you're up to the task, we have a little game where you can um, test your matching skills, see if you're able to, to match up different gray whales. We also have a tab that's all about um, stressors to whales. Um, and we highlight four stressors that we focus on in our gem lab that we study. And one of those stressors is why are kelp habitats so important to gray whales. Um, so all of you who have attended the talk can maybe skip through that one since I told you a little about it um, or, or, or read more about it to, um, yeah, to find out a little bit more information. But I would really, um, yeah, suggest that you go to individual whale yourself um, and to click through it and explore and, and meet some more of, of Oregon's gray whales. Okay, I'm just gonna switch back to the slides. Okay, I do just want to mention, though, that we are certainly not the only ones who are engaged with this uh, kelp forest topic in Oregon. Um, the Oregon Kelp Alliance is a diverse group of scientists, which we're a part of, as well as natural resource managers, tribal members, tour guides, and chefs that are all working to support healthy kelp forests. And there's numerous ongoing projects that are aimed at doing that, not just ours. And that includes there's an active urchin smashing project in, in Port Orford to see if, you know, taking all of the sea urchins out of the system will allow kelp to kind of rejuvenate um, and to regrow. There's also a project that's looking at taking urchins out of the, taking these kind of small and, and, and not very attractive purple sea urchins out of the environment and cultivating them and feeding them to see if they can get up to a, to a marketable or commercial value. Um, the Orca Alliance has also recently been, um, has been shown really big support by Senator Merkley's office and has received um, quite a bit of state funding to kind of push all of this research um, and these projects along. So while I've presented some kind of not so great results. There are a lot of people that are very dedicated to working on these topics and to making sure that we don't lose our kelp um, on the Oregon coast. And so just to quickly summarize everything that, that I've taken you through, um, we did document changes in these species occurrence data that point towards this trophic cascade having happened um, or that it is happening in Port Orford. Um, these localized declines in kelp could mean that a loss um, could are indicating towards a loss of habitat for mysid shrimp, which in turn has seemingly meant that there's been a decline in high quality prey patches for gray whales. Um, and so with the loss of kelp, it means that those high quality prey patches are less abundant and less available for foraging gray whales on our coast. Our lab also monitors body condition of gray whales, and we have been seeing somewhat of a concurrent decline in the body condition of gray whales. And there have been increased numbers of emaciated gray whales. And while we haven't kind of connected all the dots on that yet, all of that is still ongoing. What we do know is that the um, that kelp ecosystems seem to play a really important role to foraging gray whales um, on the Oregon coast. And so, I'm, I'm almost done here, just finally wrapping up. Um, I also wanna point you to our Gem Lab blog and our Gem, Web, Gem Lab website. On our blog, we post uh, weekly. And while it does mainly revolve around marine megafauna, we do also have some broader scientific, marine scientific posts um, that you can subscribe to and you'll get an email every week when, when a blog is posted. So um, that's another great website to check out. And just as a final thank you, um, I want to give to all of the uh, interns in Port Orford that have worked on this project. Um, I've been lucky enough to come into this project kind of when there's already been a massive data set to work with. And so it's it's really on the backs of a lot of these interns who, who really give it their all every summer for six weeks. And so I'm very grateful to um, all of these individuals. 
And with that, I'd be very happy to take any questions. That was fantastic, Lisa. Thank you so much. And again, if you have questions, plug them into the Q&A or the chat. Um, quite a few have come in already. Thank you for that. I always like to kick off the Q&A session with one of my own um, around kind of what was your inspiration or aha or the moment where you realized you wanted to go a little bit deeper and learn and do this research. Um, do you mean this project specifically? Yeah, or even yeah. really just like studying the mammals since you've studied so many, you know, oh. kind of the research, like what made you want to go down that path of researching mammals? Yeah, when I, it, it was really when I was, when I was um, a little younger, I, I just, I couldn't get around this fascination that like the biggest, some of the biggest animals on our planet, you know, blue whales, fin whales, including gray whales eat some of the tiniest things and that they're <laughs> able to really sustain, you know, their, their high energetic lifestyles, but, you know, they have to migrate a really long distance. Um, they, they raise calves, they have to find mates. And I, I just think it's fascinating that they're able to basically sustain that high energy, um, that high energetic livelihood on like the tiniest critters, uh, in the ocean. And I wanted to kind of, yeah, just better understand that know how they find it and and how they're able to do that it really is totally fascinating <laughs> um and then do you know how much does kelp growth so this question is is it true that kelp growth is potentially two feet per day under maximum conditions yeah bull kelp is really i i, I believe that's that's mostly applies to bull kelp and to me, that's another one of those fascinating things that, yeah, under the right conditions with the right nutrients and sunlight in the summer, bull kelp does grow. Um, since I'm German, I work on the metric system, but I believe it's, it's 30 centimeters a day, which I think might be two feet. <laughs> <laughs> and then do you know, are there any predators for a sea urchin outside of the sea star? Um, well, and sea otters. And besides the sea otter, I, I did recently read something that I think abalone might also oh. predate on sea urchins, but I think abalone is another one of those species that we don't have a lot of in Oregon. Right. So it's really, the, the pressure has really been all on the sea star to kind of keep those, those right. sea urchins in check. Um, and then you mentioned, so here's a question, how long have sea otters been absent? They've been absent for about a century. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if they get reintroduced, mm. um, will you be able to add that in as a component to your research? Oh, that's a great, that. question. that's a great question. Yeah, I will, I will, I will add as a small caveat to that, um, haven't been on the Oregon coast for a century. There was a reintroduction effort right. of sea otters in the seventies or or eighties, which was very unsuccessful. Yes. The otters essentially dispersed very quickly and left the area and as presumably went back to where they were taken from. Um, yeah, that, it's a good question about, about whether I would be able to integrate that data um, into, um, into this project. I mean, yeah, I think that would be a really fascinating addition if we could, I mean, the Port Orford project is continuing. Um, I'm, I'm no longer running it, but um, a new master's student in, in my lab, Allison Dawn, is continuing the project. So we're, we're still continuing to collect that standardized data in the same way. So potentially, I mean, who knows if and when sea otters um, may be reintroduced to the Oregon coast, but it would right. definitely be an interesting addition to this data set. Right. Um, and here's a question here too. Are sea otters still hunted for their fur? They are not. They are a federally protected species now. Um, but I would encourage folks, if you want to learn more about the sea otter story, to check out Alaka Alliance because um, they are doing their own studies on reintroducing sea otters and working with a variety of different uh, researchers and organizations on that. So I highly recommend you to check out them for more information around uh, bringing them back to the Oregon coast. Um, during your research, are you screening for ocean temperatures? Mm, that is a good question. Um, we we have been but i um i was i didn't have the kind of bandwidth or time to dig into that that is actually something that my that my successor um allison will be looking into to kind of 
better understanding um, kind of fine and mesoscale drivers of, of essentially all of these species, but predominantly zooplankton. And one of those is temperature to see how temperature might be affecting um, the abundance, the distribution, and kind of all of those relationships. Nice. Um, what is the time frame estimate for a kelp baron to regenerate if the urchin component is removed? Whoa, that that is an excellent question. Um, <laughs> And, and I don't, I don't, I could postulate here, but I don't think I will because I don't have the, the exact um, answer. I, I will say though that, that it, it can shift back and, 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 and okay. it's kind of part of this, this um, theory in ecology called alternate stable states. So once an urchin baron exists for a while, that is also a, a stable system, but at some point they, they, there will be so many urchins that they're no longer able to support, you know, the number of urchins because mm -hmm. there's no more food to be had. Um, and so eventually you see kind of the bust, like the, the collapse okay. of that population. And then you often see a reversal back to the healthy um, kelp forest system where then because all the urchins are gone, the kelp almost has like a, a, like a breath of life and is able to like reestablish itself. And then you, you, go back to the stable state of the healthy kelp for uh, ecosystem, but it could potentially swing back into uh, an urchin barren. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's technical, it's, it's, it's like not unheard of for this to happen. I mean, ecosystems do swing between these stable states, but I think the kind of the rapidity um, with which it's happening and the like large scale um, effect of this on the coast is what's, is what's worrying. So with the urchins, how do they, do they replicate really fast or when they realize there's all this kelp and not a lot of predator, you know, with the sea stars gone, is there like this magnetic call to come to this kelp forest? <laughs> like, how do they, do that's you know anything good, about that? <laughs> no, that's another good question. I think it's, I think it's more to do with once they have a lot to eat, they just, they're able to reproduce more or quicker okay. rather than like lots coming from, from other Got areas. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any comparison studies in the Channel Islands around kelp growth five miles offshore, which is part of the national park system? Mm, interesting. No, um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I mean, I know that there's a there's a lot of kelp studies currently going on all all up and down the coast, but um, I mean, it's 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 kind of tricky to do to to be able to incorporate both the you know mm -hmm. how 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 fine scale we were able to get with our project with with being able to quantify you know zooplankton urchins and kelp as well as gray whales. Um, I mean, the Port Orford um, kind of study site is is quite unique because you you need you need a spot where you're able to launch a kayak and not have to, you know, pa right. paddle for miles, um, but also to be able to see gray whales from shore. Um, I think there are potentials to replicate this in certain areas on the coast, but but not necessarily so doable everywhere. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, and here's just kind of a statement from someone around uh, that bottom trawling can also affect kelp. Um, and eating fish contributes uh, to that practice too. Okay, um, so bottom trawling can also affect that. Um, does this same information apply to humpbacks, or do they forage on different food sources? And do they have do do they forage at different sites? Um, great question. Yeah, so humpbacks are are more kind of deep water foragers because they feed on krill. Um, and krill are, are not really like mysid shrimp. Um, they, they, you tend to find them like deeper in the water column and they're not really associated with reefs or with kelp. You just kind of find them in, yeah, in mid water columns. Um, and so that's mm -hmm. why we don't really see humpbacks coming in or other, mm -hmm. other, other whales like blue whales or fin whales coming in as close as gray whales mm -hmm. because they're not really able to maneuver in these really shallow rocky, um, 
habitats and around kelp. I, I think a lot of those whale species would, would be kind of lost at how to do that. But gray whales, because they're compactor, we like to call them really bendy. They're able to do these really, and if you go to the talk on Tuesday by my um, lab mate, Clara Bird, you'll see a lot of, of like really cool movements and behaviors of how these gray whales are really able to maneuver their bodies around kelp on reefs in shallow waters um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's really unique to gray whales that they, that they feed in these kind of kelp habitats. And then just want to throw out a couple um, notes of congratulations or thank yous. Um, excellent presentation. Hope you're headed to being an instructor of marine science. You're a good lecturer. Oh, thank you. Um, and then we also have a, a thank you to you um, that your research connects many dots for this person because they've listened to many of our presentations. So they were able to tie quite a bit together um, in giving a big picture. So kudos on that. Um, will individual whale a website be posting more gray whale IDs? Um, yes, it's it's definitely a a a um we we hope that the website will be kind of an like ongoing and and we'll we'll always have you know kind of more content generated to it um it may take us some time to build some more profiles once once you go in there and you look at it i mean it, it really takes you know six seven years for us to to have been able to build these eight whale profiles to be able to document those you know those unique um you know, events in the lives of these gray whales and to be able to understand their their movements, their patterns, their their health. Um, it's definitely a goal of ours, but I can't say how soon there will be more whales. On there. <laughs> um, this person says they have done a project, the person who asked that question, uh, where they take uh, photos and have documented quite a few, it looks like down in California. Hmm. Um, so that's very interesting. I bet that's a fun thing to do. Um, somebody yeah. knows here they have sea otters on the central coast in California. Yes, that's true. I have traveled down there just to see the sea otters myself. Um, and I do believe that a lock alliance is looking at that and how the aquarium, Monterey Bay Aquarium down there cares for them and reintroduces them into the wild as well. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. <laughs> somebody mentions that 30, 30 centimeters is 11.8 inches. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Which is about a foot. <laughs> about a foot. Okay. I might be wrong in the 30 centimeters then because I have also heard two feet. But yes, we'll help you grow a lot. Let's go with a lot in a day. <laughs> um, let's see. Love your presentation. Great attitude. Okay. Can you share Clara's location information? Let me post a link where folks can um where folks can go there for more information and get registered right here that's the link where you can find out more information on that um and then let's see has an attempt been made to cultivate and reintroduce kelp to barren areas off the oregon coast mm, good question um you know, that one, I don't know. That's a good question. I do know of efforts of lab rearing uh, sea stars, specifically Pycnopodia. So the big sunflower sea stars um, that are, are absolutely beautiful, but were, I think, one of, one of the species that was most hard hit by sea star wasting disease and the warm blob. I know of efforts to try and like lab rear babies of those to then reintroduce into into the marine environment but i haven't heard of any kelp efforts okay and then lee posted some link for everybody too if you're looking through the chat uh, to a new york times article around um purple sea urchins off the california coast Oh, I'd have to go read the article to know more. I would just encourage you to go read it um, before I just botch everything about it. <laughs> um, let's see here. We recently had a gray whale calf watch, wash up on the Yahats beach last year. Um, are there efforts to figure out which gray whales may have been, a, you know, apparent or thinking individual and in efforts to track calves? Um, 
Yes. I mean, we definitely, when we conduct our research and we see uh, calves with their moms, we, you know, we, we study them as we do all of our other whales. Um, one of the long-term um, um, kind of questions that we're hoping to, to answer is whether or not, I didn't really go into all the details around what mm -hmm. gray whales we have on our coast, but basically the gray whales that we see in the summer after June, for, between June 1st and August 15th, our, um, our gray whale is part of a group called the Pacific Coast Feeding Group, which is this kind of small, unique group of about 250 um, to 350 whales that don't undertake the traditional migration from Mexico to the Arctic, but instead they feed in, in the Pacific Northwest along kind of Northern California, Oregon, Washington, and the Southern British Columbia coast. Um, and, um, and so one of the kind of long-term research question that, that we and other researchers that study this group are is how are kind of whales recruited into this PCFG group? You know, is it, is it mm -hmm. that moms who to come here and give birth to their calves, do, they, do those calves come back and continue that kind of tradition of, of feeding here? Or is it more random? Is it just, you know, whoever's a curious whale and, and stops in and sees, this, sees that there's good food here too, um, does that? Um, still kind of an open-ended question and one that takes a lot, a, many, many years of, of data to answer. So right. we're, we're working together with, with um, other scientists along the coast to, to, to like pool all resources and to see if we can um, answer that question. Very cool. And just to circle back around to the New York Times article, it points out that the purple sea urchin are mostly inedible because mm -hmm. they have a very little uni, which are gonads. Very interesting. Yeah, that's a good, uh, yeah, that's a not good. Not a lot of meat in there, huh? No, yeah, and, and and that's why there's there's some of these. They're also, I mean, obviously, um, uh, sea urchin is another big fishery in Oregon, but right. all, but again, that fishery doesn't target these purple urchins. They're looking for the big, juicy red urchins because uh, the gonads or the uni, which which is the marketable thing, mm -hmm. are bigger and sweeter and more delicious than the big urchins. Which is why there's some of those cultivation projects to see if you can take these kind of small and Got not it. so good purple urchins out and feed them will they grow and so th the same thing is kind of maybe applies to the sea otters you know why would a sea otter want to eat a small mm -hmm. you know not really delicious sea urchin when it can <laughs> go for bigger bigger yeah. ones too so, so there are questions around that you know it, it probably isn't as straightforward as oh if we just bring in otters all of those mm -hmm. purple sea urchins will disappear because otters are also a predator that needs to, that need to much like gray whales sustain a very high energetic yes. lifestyle. And so they have to go for the best, the best, uh, a lot. <laughs> too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they need to be selective on, on, you know, what yeah. they spend their time on, you know, cracking open an urchin and stuff. Do you know of any upcoming opportunities for volunteering? This person's a biologist from Germany and they'd love to get more involved in the cetacean projects. Um, probably, um, probably too much to go into now, but I would suggest that if you, if you email me, um, get in touch with me, then I can connect you to the right people or, or see if we have a project, uh, going on to, to kind of connect you to. And I'm typing in her email address, um, just so you can copy and paste it if you want. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. We're getting to the end. Lisa, uh, Oregon is very lucky to have such an enthusiastic student scientist willing to study the issues impacting the health of the ocean. Um, she, they are sure that plastics and particulates have an, have some related impacts. Um, they hope that kelp beds can be managed and learn to die. They learned to dive in the central coast of California and the kelp beds were magnificent back in the 70s. Keep up the good work. Oh, I Again, bet. more thanks for you thinking um, if, if there, they were wondering if there were efforts to tie whale poop collected to any DNA of deceased whales that beach in our area. Mm. That was a thanks in regards to the question previously asked. Oh, gotcha. About the, the gray whale. Yes. So we do, um, um, the Marine Mail Institute has a stranding coordinator, Jim Rice, who responds to basically all strandings on the Oregon coast, not just of gray whales, but of all marine mammals. Um, and, and when, when, when individuals strand, you know, 
if if you know the Oregon coast can sometimes be be tricky to certain places to get to and things but he tries as best as he can to take images of of the whales and you know we sometimes also try to match um photos of stranded whales to our catalog to see um if you know if we know those individuals I will say that from 2019 to 2021 um there was an unusual mortality event declared by NOAA for gray whales. Mm -hmm. um, and an unusual mortality event is when the average number of, of whales that are stranding, um, or, or when the number of whales that are stranding are above average for, for what is normal in a year. Um, and so we had a lot of stranded whales in, in, in that time period in, in Mexico, in all across the US and in Canada. Um, but it everything seems to point to that most of those whales weren't from the Pacific Coast feeding group. So that they weren't from these 250 to 350 whales that we see year after year. Um, it seems that it was more whales in the Arctic that were affected by this. So potentially, you know, changes in prey up there meant that not enough whales were getting enough food. And so they were mm -hmm. too skinny to kind of right. sustain their lifestyle. Um, yeah. Yeah. One other thing that I will say about the comment about microplastics is that is a project that we are um, also currently looking into. We're, mm. we're looking at the microplastic levels in the zooplankton and then whether that magnifies up to the gray whales. Okay. So, so keep your eyes on the horizon for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then it looks like Lee also posted a link. Uh, so folks, if you're in the chat, take a look at the link. Um, it's on a whale and seal study. Um, they did Ocean Life Symposium on both radio and YouTube the last couple of years. You can find out some more information on the study on whales and seals that way too. Um, and yes, with that, just want to give a big thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. It is very apparent that you have a very energetic and um, inspiring presentation style, which is fantastic because it makes for easy learning and gets folks excited about wanting to dig a bit deeper. Thank you. Um, so I really appreciate you joining us and doing this. And thank you to the audience for all your wonderful questions and curiosities. Always love to see uh, what you uh, uh, ask. Um, learn a lot through that as well. So, absolutely, I have some of my best questions from from, from <laughs> yeah. this group. I, I remember it from last year. There were some really, really good questions. So thank you so much for having me. I I love presenting to to Cape Perpetual Club. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend, and hope to see you at a future presentation. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>